Sherry Papini's kidnapping case, or should I say alleged kidnapping case, is one of the most controversial and widely debated cases in California history. Was it a senseless crime with no real motive? Did her captors have a change of heart? Or was it all an act from a woman who needed just a little bit of attention. In today's episode, we're going to closely examine the details and conspiracy theories surrounding Sherry's case, and you can decide for yourself what you really think went down. Let's jump in. So Sherry Papini was this cute little blonde gal living her life in Northern California with her husband Keith and two young kids. On November 2nd, 2016, 34-year-old Sherry went for a jog about a mile away from her home in Redding. Sherry disappeared and was missing for 22 whole days until she showed up 150 miles away, frantic, wide-eyed, and running along the interstate. She was found completely emaciated, weighing only 87 pounds. She was battered and bruised. A chain was around her waist with her left arm attached to it with a zip tie, and her famous blonde locks had been chopped off. The case garnered a ton of media attention and people needed to know all the details so they could speculate to their heart's content. So here's the established timeline of events according to Sherry Keith and the evidence. So on November 2nd, Sherry's husband Keith got home from his job at Best Buy around 6 p.m. and couldn't find Sherry or the kids. Obviously this was very unusual as Sherry was a stay-at-home mom, so he called the daycare and asked if she ever picked up the kids. The daycare informed him no. Sherry never came by and the kids were still there. Panicked, Keith used find my iPhone and located Sherry's phone with her headphones lying on a road a mile from their home. Before he picked it up though, he got the bright idea to take a picture of it for evidence since it looks suspicious. Never hurts to take a picture when it could be evidence later. Keith then reported Sherry missing and the case went viral with everyone and their mother out looking for Sherry. The authorities first looked into the people closest to Sherry beginning with Keith, but after a solid alibi and passing a polygraph test, the cops didn't believe Keith was behind it, so they continued with their large-scale manhunt. Little evidence was found until Thanksgiving Day when Sherry was discovered on the side of the highway at 4.30 in the morning, 150 miles away from home. But some people thought this Turkey Day miracle smelled a little fishy. The investigators thought so too, and they weren't sure what to believe when Sherry's husband went public with her side of the story. Sherry claimed that she had been taken by two Hispanic women and held hostage for the whole 22 days. What happened during those 22 days? We don't know exactly. The whole case has been kept very private for unknown reasons, but here are the very different facts that she'd given throughout the years. The women wore masks the whole time, so Sherry said that she never really knew what they actually looked like. She said that woman number one was young and the woman number two was old. Woman number one had curly hair with thin eyebrows and woman number two had straight hair with thick, bushy eyebrows. The police hired a sketch artist to do a rendering of the woman, but it was super vague because Sherry's details were in fact super vague. When the women weren't wearing masks, Sherry said they usually put a bag over her head. The same bag that Sherry used to attract the attention of the passerby on the highway by waving it through the air after she was allegedly shoved out of the moving car. She also said the woman only spoke in Spanish so she had no idea what was going on or where she was or she was even in a car. A dark SUV is all she remembered. And then for seemingly no reason, the woman just dropped her off at 4.30 in the morning on Thanksgiving day on the side of the road. Super weird, right? Other people thought so too and were quick to attack her online saying the whole thing was a hoax. As far as the police were concerned, they really couldn't commit it either way. The first strange character in the case that made people suspicious was this. Supposedly there was this anonymous donor who hired an expert hostage negotiator to make a YouTube video saying that a donor was offered a $50,000 reward for the return of Sherry. The negotiator pissed off police by interfering with their investigation and he eventually took down the video. The reward was never given out and no one knows who this random donor was. The strangest part about this is that the negotiator took down his video just one day before Sherry turned back up, which people found suspicious. Another detail that emerged that people thought looked staged was how Sherry's phone looked when it was discovered. Keith had called 911 and reported that he found his wife's phone a mile from their home in the grass after tracking it. And he was concerned because he said there were pieces of her hair in the wire headphones, almost like they had been forcibly ripped from her head in a struggle. But when you look at the picture, the headphones are neatly wrapped up on top of the phone and there aren't many visible strands of hair that you can detect with your naked eye. And just because there was some of her hair in the headphones doesn't necessarily mean it was ripped from her head. This led to a lot of people to believe that Keith was an accomplice in Sherry's story and that he could have placed her phone in the grass and taken a picture. A lot of people thought the couple was in on it to get fame and money and some began withdrawing their donations from the GoFundMe set up to help Sherry and her family with bills, calling it a get rich quick scheme. Another deed that is highly unusual for this type of case 
is that the fact that Sherry claimed she was abducted by Hispanic women. As avid true crime fans, you're probably well aware of the fact that a female captor is possible, but highly unlikely. Experts reported how rare it was for a woman to nap another woman. They also mentioned it's super unusual for nappers to conceal their identities. Something else that didn't check out statistically was the fact that the women grabbed a 35-year-old woman. Most of the time, children and teens go missing, not adults. But of course, just because something isn't likely doesn't necessarily mean it's not possible. That's what a lot of people thought until a web sleuth would discover something even more incriminating about the Hispanic women aspect of the case. They were able to dig up some very racist and anti-Latino posts made in 2003 on a skinhead's blog by a woman with Sherry Papini's maiden name, Graf. In some articles penned by a woman named Sherry Graf, she talked about her pride for her white roots and heritage, how to properly be a good skinhead wife to your skinhead husband, and how she and her family have continuously stood up to Latinos in the past. What the hell? Sherry's father and husband denied that Sherry was the author of this blog and blamed it on punks, but the damage had already been done. Some people believed this further proved it was all a hoax and that Sherry used this as another reason to villainize Latinos further with some even suggesting that she was trying to start a race war. Some other people believe that she was actually taken, but that Sherry just said it was by two Hispanic women because she's racist. And on top of that, some other web sleuths found Sherry's old Pinterest where she had a board titled Cultural Differences. And on that board, she'd pinned some very pro-white posts. Another aspect of the case that doesn't make sense to people is the fact that after 22 days, her captors just randomly decided to release her. While it's not unheard of for victims to show back up later like Elizabeth Smart, it's very odd that no ransom money or motive was ever figured out. Why would two women just grab this mom who was out for a jog and then starve, beat, chain, and brand her to then just let her go after all that? And speaking of the branding, what's up with that? Sherry had a brand on her shoulder and the police said that they believed it'd be some sort of message, but it was done pretty terribly. It's not uncommon for traffickers to brand their victims with certain symbols that indicate things, but why would they put a potential identifying mark on this woman only to just let her go? The branding was actually a detail the investigators were hoping to keep private. Keith revealed that detail in an emotional interview for 2020, only a few days later after her reappearance. Some speculate that Keith Papini's interview on 2020 was too strange for a husband in grief and that he had something to do with her disappearance. Of course, it's impossible to tell how anyone would react in a stage of such immense shock and stress. And it very well could have been Keith's natural reaction to it all, but we won't really ever know for sure. The police tried not to be upset with Keith for revealing such a key detail in the investigation, but they couldn't blame him for trying to defend his wife under a harsh wave of accusation from the public. Keith went into great detail about his wife's emaciated body when he first saw her and how she had yellowing bruises from old wounds as well as fresh deep bruises and restraint marks that indicated weeks of torture. That's the thing about this case that always gets me is that when people fake their attacks, their wounds are always described as superficial and it's clear that they're self-inflicted. But with Sherry, it was very clear that she was in bad shape. Her nose was even broken. She had lost 15% of her body weight in 22 days. She had burns, cuts, and bruises. I just find it hard to believe that a person could actually do this to themselves, which of course led to even more interesting theories. Some people believe that Sherry was into substances and went on an all out bender for 22 days, which would explain the weight loss and injuries. However, Sherry is often described as super mom and the perfect mom in many articles and friends and to everyone who knew Sherry, her world revolved around her kids. She never swore, she was kind to everyone she met, and she lived a relatively quiet, humble life. Others believe that maybe this super mom had been living a double life, and maybe she'd spent the weeks away with a lover and was into some kinky activities that would result in the injuries. This was definitely an angle that the police were pursuing and they discovered an alleged male acquaintance from Michigan. Some texts were found in Sherry's phone from some dude that was planning to meet up with Sherry just a few days before she disappeared because he was coming to town for business, but they never found evidence to connect the guy to her disappearance. Remember that Pinterest account? Well, it turns out there was another board with a rather strange theme. This one was titled Alter Ego and featured a lot of submissive housewife type posts. So at first, people thought the theory to be preposterous, but after seeing this board, their perspectives changed a little bit. 
And as it turned out though, Sherry's record wasn't necessarily as clean as everyone said it was. During the years of 2000 to 2003, her family made multiple calls to law enforcement regarding her mental health and some breakdowns she had had. In 2000, Sherry's dad called the cops on her when she robbed his house. Three years later, he alleged that she made unauthorized withdrawals from his bank account. And that same year, Sherry's mom called the police to report that Sherry had been harming herself and saying that she had done it to her own daughter. There were also some Facebook allegations that were made by Pepini's in-laws that claimed Sherry had attempted to stage her own abduction in 2006. When police working the case still say that they have no reason to believe that her kidnapping was a hoax, some experts who have looked at the case say that a history of harming herself and blaming others sheds a different light on the case entirely. However, the experts maintain that just because there are odd details about a case, it doesn't mean straight up the whole thing was fabricated. So it's entirely possible that Sherry Papini is a real victim and has had to go through the unfortunate experience of her life being put under the microscope by the public to prove she's a liar. While Sherry may not be the perfect person everyone says she is, it doesn't necessarily prove that she would go all gone girl just for some attention. And besides, since the incident, Sherry has gone back to her private quiet life as a stay at home mom and neighbors say she hardly ever leaves the house anymore due to cameras and paparazzi constantly following her around. Wouldn't someone who did this for attention be absolutely loving her own personal camera crew following her around? To me, it seems this poor woman is just trying to pick up the pieces to continue living a life as normal as she can. As of now, Sherry has never appeared in public or gone to the media to speak about her ordeal. No arrests have ever been made in her case and no motive has ever been disclosed. So much of me immediately thinks it's suspicious and I start to believe that she faked it for attention, but when I hear about the injuries and the weight loss and the torture, how could she have done that to herself? I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching.